Have you ever wondered what it was like when the skies became a battleground for supersonic travel? In the 1960s, an epic race to build the first supersonic passenger jets captivated the world. The British and French joined forces on one side to create the Concorde, a beacon of luxury and cutting-edge technology. On the other hand, the Soviet Union pushed forward the Tu-144, fueled by a fierce desire to showcase its engineering might. These aviation marvels took flight amidst high stakes and intense competition, leading to a saga of triumphs, failures, and unexpected challenges. Meet the Tupolev 144 from the Soviet Union, the only other supersonic jet that ever flew commercial passengers. It looks much like the Concorde, but flying on it was a much different experience. The story of the Tu-144 is fascinating and full of twists. At first glance, it's clear it borrowed heavily from the Concorde's design. But the Tu-144 did manage to outdo the Concorde in some ways. It could carry more passengers and flew faster. Yet the real story of the Tu-144 is about deception. It tried to be something, but it wasn't. The aircraft was all about misleading the world, pretending to match the Concorde, but it couldn't keep up in terms of refinement and safety. Even though it showed great promise, the Tu-144's journey is marked by the fallout of trying to maintain an unsustainable facade. In the 1960s, building a supersonic passenger jet wasn't just about speed, it was a showdown between the Soviet Union and the Western world. Three big players jumped into the race. The Americans with their Boeing 2707, which never quite got off the ground, the Brits and the French teaming up on the Concorde, and the Soviets with their Tu-144. The Americans hit roadblocks, thanks to their bureaucratic mess and spiraling costs, and eventually, they were out of the running. That left the Concorde in the lead, with the Tu-144 and Boeing 2707 trailing in the quest for supersonic travel. The Soviet Union, with its less advanced tech, had a tough time catching up in the supersonic jet race. So, they turned to espionage. Soviet spies swiped around 100,000 technical documents about the Concorde and other planes. This major information boost sped things up for them, and the Tu-144 flew two months before the Concorde. The Concorde focused heavily on passenger comfort, but the Tu-144 missed the mark. Despite looking similar to the Concorde, it lagged behind in offering a pleasant experience. Journalists raved about the Concorde's peaceful, quiet flights, where attendants easily served martinis. The Tu-144, however, told a different story. Western journalists couldn't ignore its flaws cramped seats, window shades dropping randomly, and some bathrooms out of order. The loud engines and poor cooling system made conversations nearly impossible. While the Concorde offered smooth, enjoyable flights, the Tu-144's design and tech issues led to a much less appealing experience. The Tu-144 was stuck on a single route between Moscow and Almaty, Kazakhstan, its only passenger service. One big problem? It guzzled fuel like crazy due to its inefficient engines. This meant it couldn't handle long distances, not even across the vast Soviet Union. Meanwhile, the Concorde could zip across continents and oceans with ease. Even though there were seven more Tu-144s ready to fly, they only took off once a week. The plane's inefficiency and short range limited its use and resulted in poor passenger service. The Tu-144's operational history raises serious questions about Soviet confidence in their aircraft. Out of 102 scheduled flights, there were a whopping 226 mechanical failures, with 80 being bad enough to cause major delays or cancellations. These constant technical issues messed up travel plans and put passengers at risk. The thought of the Tu-144 crashing with passengers was a huge political gamble for the Soviet government. Such disasters could mean loss of life and damage the Soviet Union's reputation in aviation worldwide. Despite efforts to show off their technical skills and compete with the West, the Tu-144's frequent breakdowns and safety issues made people wonder if it should have ever been used for passenger flights. From the start, the Tu-144 faced major scrutiny over its airworthiness. Its history was dotted with alarming incidents, casting serious doubts on its safety. A huge disaster struck at the 1973 Paris Air Show, when the Tu-144 crashed in front of thousands, drawing massive attention to its reliability. Despite efforts to fix things, major accidents kept happening. In 1978, a cargo version crashed due to a fuel line rupture, raising more concerns about its design. Then, in 1981, an engine explosion forced an emergency landing, highlighting ongoing issues. These crashes and incidents created doubt over the Tu-144's safety and effectiveness as a supersonic passenger jet. 
The repeated failures didn't just question its design and engineering, they led to its limited operational life and eventual discontinuation from commercial service. The development of the Tu-144 was undeniably rushed, with the Soviet Union pushing to complete it before the Concorde. This urgency led to cutting corners during construction. Despite this, Soviet engineers deserve credit for pulling it off. On the other hand, the Concorde's team had access to advanced Rolls-Royce Olympus engines with computer-controlled inlets, enabling a supercruise feature. This allowed the Concorde to maintain supersonic speeds without relying on a fuel-guzzling afterburners once it reached the supersonic zone. Meanwhile, the Tu-144's engineers had to work with engines that needed constant afterburner use to stay supersonic. The Concorde also boasted a sophisticated wing design, optimized for both supersonic and low-speed flight. In contrast, the Tu-144's wing was mainly suited for supersonic flight, forcing pilots to land at higher speeds, sometimes needing a parachute to slow down. To offset the wing's limitations, the Soviets added cannons deployable wings at the front to improve low-speed stability. Even with innovation on both sides of the Iron Curtain, supersonic travel was still pricey. Concorde tickets cost a fortune in the capitalist West, often five to six times more than a regular flight. So, flying on the Concorde became a symbol of luxury and glamour, attracting the wealthy and famous. Meanwhile, in the communist Soviet Union, things were different. They faced a tough question. Who would actually fly on the Tu-144? The high cost of supersonic travel made it hard to find a market, leading to low passenger interest. This only added to the Tu-144's problems, affecting its commercial success. A ticket for the Tu-144 was priced at a mere 37 rubles, not much more than a regular flight. This low price, however, couldn't cover the huge costs of running a supersonic jet. The cheap tickets and high operational expenses led to financial trouble for the Tu-144. Similarly, the Concorde, though popular among celebrities and the wealthy, was also a commercial flop. Despite its elite clientele, the Concorde's steep operational costs and limited passenger capacity meant it never turned a profit. Both the TE-144 and Concorde faced major financial challenges due to the high costs of maintaining and operating supersonic jets, ultimately preventing them from becoming successful commercial ventures. Both the French and the British governments poured huge amounts of money into developing the Concorde, aware early on that selling enough units to cover the costs would be tough. Yet, they went ahead, motivated by prestige and national pride. Meanwhile, the Tu-144 didn't have the same luxury niche or market demand. It served more as a propaganda tool, showcasing Soviet technological prowess. Without a real commercial market, the Tu-144 had limited practical uses. The Concorde flew passengers for an impressive 27 years, retiring in 2003. In stark contrast, the Tu-144's passenger service barely lasted a year, plagued by technical issues, safety concerns, and low demand. This short-lived venture highlighted the tough challenges of supersonic travel and the struggle to keep such projects going. The Tu-144's failure boils down to three main points. First, political pressure. The Soviet Union, in a hurry to beat the Concorde, rushed the Tu-144's development, leading to design flaws. It was more about Soviet prestige and propaganda than a sustainable commercial purpose. Second, limited resources. Though Soviet engineers were skilled, they did send the first human to space. The Tu-144 project suffered from fewer resources compared to the Concorde team. They lacked an excellent engine. The Kolesov RD-3651 turbojets needed continuous afterburner use to stay supersonic guzzling fuel and limiting range. Third, market appeal. The Tu-144 couldn't find a viable commercial market. High operating costs and the inability to compete with subsonic aircraft regarding economics and comfort were major issues. Its design didn't prioritize passenger luxury and several accidents shattered public confidence. So, there you have it. The wild, tumultuous journey of the Tu-144, the Soviet Union's ambitious attempt at supersonic travel. From espionage and engineering challenge to high-stakes political gambles, the story of the T-144 is a fascinating chapter in aviation history. While it may not have matched the Concorde in luxury or longevity, it played a crucial role in the race for supersonic dominance. Let us know in the comments what you think about the T-144 and if there are any other aircraft tales you'd like us to explore.